morning. My name is Chris Johnson. I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS. Uh, thanks for coming to see us today uh, for this fantastic event. We're very pleased to have our two panelists with us today. It's going to be an exciting discussion on uh, Chinese ideology and, uh, and propaganda. Um, main presenter today will be uh, Dr. Maria Repnikova, who's a scholar of political communication in illiberal contexts with a focus on Chinese media politics. She's currently an assistant professor of global communications and a director of the Center for Global Information Studies at Georgia State University. Maria's work examines critical journalism, political propaganda, cyber nationalism, and global media branding in China. Her work appeared in China Quarterly, New Media and Society, the Journey, uh, excuse me, Journal of Contemporary China, as well as Foreign Affairs and Foreign Policy, amongst other venues. And her book, Media Politics in China, Improvising Power Under Authoritarianism, just came out with Cambridge University Press, which was, gave us the idea to host her today. <laughs> and um, in the past, Maria was a postdoctoral fellow at the Annenberg School for Communication. And as I mentioned, she holds a PhD in politics from Oxford University, where she was a Rhodes Scholar. So certainly a very strong expert on the subject. Uh, we're also joined by Kaiser Guo, who is host and co-founder of the Seneca podcast, uh, the most popular English language podcast on China, and uh, just a fantastic resource for anyone who's looking at China on a regular basis. Um, a native of upstate New York, born to parents originally from China, uh, Kaiser spent a year in Beijing after graduating from the University of California, Berkeley. Um, in 1989, he co-founded the Beijing-based heavy metal band Tong Dynasty, uh, a band that went to considerable success during the 1990s. Uh, he then took a position as editor-in-chief at China Now, one of China's first bilingual online magazines, where he oversaw an editorial team across China of over 30 writers. Uh, Kaiser wrote a popular humor column in China's leading English language newspaper, That's Beijing and The Beijinger, from 2001 to 2011, with his columns anthologized in 2009 in a book called Ich bin ein Beijinger. So we're very happy to have him here uh, to commentate uh, today. So uh, if you will, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Rapnikova to the podium to deliver her address. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you to Scott uh, Kennedy for inviting me and to Chris for moderating. And it's an honor to be next to Kaiser, whose work I've observed and listened to for many years. So today, we're going to talk about a very significant and tumultuous topic of uh, Chinese media politics and ideology under President Xi. And I suspect most of you came here to hear what's new right, in this era. And we always hear about new upgrades, new updates, in particular when it comes to control. But I want to start perhaps with a slight uh, bit of disappointment, because the main dominant media policy in China since uh, the Mao era has really remained quite constant when it comes to the media really serving the party's interests. Although the terms that are used to describe this role have changed. As you see here on the slide, they've changed from propaganda to guidance of the public opinion, to public opinion channeling, to public opinion struggle. So the terms that are used are quite um, somewhat distinct, but the, the idea that the media should serve the party's interests has not really transformed. And despite the focus in the past months and even in the past years, I would say, on President Xi's address to top three official news outlets and this whole idea of media having the last name of the party or being the mouthpiece of the party is something revolutionary, my analysis of the same phenomenon over the past decade suggests that similar statements just in different form were made by other um, officials, both at the central level but also provincial and local levels. So the idea that the media should align with the party is something that's been quite, quite constant for a long time. Um, but that said, the party has been adapting and adjusting its mechanisms uh, of persuasion and propaganda, in particular in the past several years. And this adaptation or reinvention goes far beyond the widely popularized, and to many of you familiar, notion of media crackdown. And of course, here are the facets of crackdown that many of you have heard about. The intensification of censorship, centralization of internet regulation, the expansion of repression, forceful infusion of party's ideology and Xi Jinping's thought into every facet of public life. But what often gets less understood, less talked about, are the softer modes of persuasion, the subtle ways that the party is trying to attract, alluring the public into the party's orbit. And that's something I'm hoping to discuss with you uh, today. But to start with, the idea that the public opinion is completely captured or controlled by the party, I would say, is somewhat false, because the reference to public opinion in Chinese discourse has been that of a battlefield. The idea that there's the fight for public opinion, there's a way to kind of struggle for it, as opposed to simply to capture it uh, in one instant through control. And Xi Jinping himself have talked about this notion of captivating online public opinion and the importance of more creative online propaganda, new energies, new synergies 
new ideas are necessary, and many conferences have been convened over time to discuss uh, the fact that this battlefield is something quite contentious and requires new tactics. Uh, and while we, we hear a lot about this battlefield over the years, uh, what's new in the past several years are the challenges that are becoming quite astute, in particular the shrinkage of the traditional media industry. Right? The newspaper industry is going down as it is everywhere in the world, but in China it's been quite dramatic as well. Uh, since 2016, like one year, um, statistics themselves are about 7.6% drop in the industry uh, revenues for newspaper industry, but their larger revenues over the 10-year period are much, much uh, higher when it comes to their shrinkage, so almost nobody's reading newspapers, and they're paying much less attention to official messages of the past. You know, people are increasingly consuming um, various apps and uh, self-media, all kinds of different uh, platforms, including digital media outlets where just basically catering content to individual consumers, right? You can look at your stories on your feed and only read what you want to read as opposed to being forced a particular type of content in a newspaper. So dealing with this uh, crisis, you know, we see all sorts of slogans, of course, that are familiar to many of you visiting China, the celebration of 19th Party Congress, the China Dream, and there was an article in the New York Times over this weekend suggesting that, you know, over a commute to work, right, as journalists saw so all sorts of slogans and uh, various kinds of forceful modes of propaganda, but if you look closely enough, who is paying attention, right? If you look at consumers, the so-called audience, they're hardly looking up their, from their phones, and uh, Chinese citizens, I would argue, are increasingly subsiding in sort of individualized platforms of information consumption. They're hardly paying attention to those large posters that are so admirably hanging in various public spaces. So if that's not quite working, what are the new upgrades? So today I just want to talk about three particular upgrades that I've been researching in my work. There are many other facets that might be new, but these are the ones I want to highlight because I think they're important and they're also going to expand over the next few years. Uh, the first one is the state-led digitalization and modernization of traditional media. The second is the personification of official ideology, the creation of a more personable, relatable, and interactive imagery of President Xi. And the last one is globalization of China's propaganda work, the idea of positioning China as a global leader, not only for global consumers, but also for Chinese domestic audiences, primarily so, I would argue. So to start with the first uh, notion of digitalization, this is sort of a response of the Chinese government to the crisis of uh, you know, the failing media industry, the traditional media industry decline, which of course we're all experiencing here in the West as well, but the difference is that Chinese government has a lot of money to rescue uh, and to kind of reinvent the media sphere. So this rescue has been manifesting itself in two ways. One is the creation of new state-funded digital-only news outlets. They're only online and they're completely funded by the state, but they exist subside within large state media corporations. And the second one is creation of new party media apps that are basically created to refresh and reinvent the image of official media like Xinhua News Agency and People's Daily. So the first uh, digitalization manifestation, this idea of new media apps, particularly is present in Shanghai. Shanghai has been the center of this innovation. I've been looking into this for a couple of years with a colleague at Penn, Pang Ke Cheng, and we've looked at Pang Pai in particular. I don't know how many of you have heard of this uh, outlet, the paper. Anybody in the room has uh -huh. a couple of papers, a couple of you. So it's become quite popular, one of the most popular, I would say, <laughs> media outlets in China, completely sponsored by Shanghai government. Uh, and the reason it's become so popular is because it really has successfully created this imagery of a professional, almost commercialized like news outlet that publishes quite a bit of in-depth and some investigative reporting, uh, but also pretty good journalism, but also very sophisticated and playful for what they refer to as purified propaganda, so very playful pieces uh, about the party state and about President Xi, as well as very interactive features where users and readers can actually talk to the producers of content. They can directly chat with them. There are all sorts of ways to engage, sort of like in a podcast platform, uh, but it's actually a traditional sort of type news outlet. So it has done very well to the point that many other um, governments uh, across China, in particular party propaganda officials, have tried to copy Pang Pai. So there was a big conference in Shanghai, which we read a lot about in our research, uh, that brought together propaganda officials from all over China, as well as various uh, journalists and editors, to learn from the success of Shanghai in general. But in particular, Pang Pai was highlighted quite a bit. How do we copy this outlet? How do we copy its success? So as you see here, these are just some names of the copycats of Pang Pai that emerged um, all over China, not in every province, but quite a few places around the country. Uh, we visited each one of them and talked to their uh, the key producers, editors in charge, and, and journalists, we found that, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for some people, they actually failed for the most part. And the reason why they failed is because uh, local officials have been quite conservative with content creation. So unlike Pang Pai that allowed for some more interesting and well, one would say even intriguing content uh, to appear, all of those localized outlets started out with this idea that we want good journalism, we wanted to investigate a reporting, but they didn't last very long. They started to really sort of... Uh, die out uh, within months and uh, turn into more like data journalism platforms or localized news. So they didn't go 
they didn't go very far. But at the same time, the attempt itself is quite fascinating. The idea that something emerges at the center and has been attempted to copy you know, across the country, I think is very interesting and important to pay attention to. Uh, the second manifestation of digitalization are, is the emergence of various apps, you know, which have public accounts that are linked to official media like People's Daily and Sinqua News, but they have different names. So a lot of them have just different names. You don't even know, unless you know about these apps, that they're directly sponsored by the party. And the environments within which journalists or producers of content work when it comes to those apps are also quite, quite unique. They almost resemble a startup environment. When I visit it, it looks very open and free. There are a lot of young people gathered from across the country. And the content they create is, is sort of far away from very official, dogmatic kind of propaganda. They talk about practical tips of how to get a train ticket during high holiday season, you know, how to send your kids to university, to how to pass the national entrance exams. Uh, and also various content referring to entertainment and popular culture. So really trying to kind of cater to young people um, and cater also quite individually to particular types of you know, groups. So it's very much a content that's, some of it is for younger women, some of it is for parents, some of it is for students. So it's quite sophisticated and well done. And there are many of these apps that have um, have spread out in recent years, and they're being quite, uh, quite popular um, amongst users. So th this is just a little bit popping out a bit slowly, but this is, these are the different types of apps, and some of them have been really at the top of uh, public WeChat accounts when it comes to readership and likes. So how real that is and how much people are actually reading them versus clicking is a question, and I think a lot of the producers are asking the same question. But the idea that they've managed to go this far is already, I think, quite intriguing. So the second... Um, upgrade that I wanted to discuss today is, is uh, the personification of ideology. So we hear a lot about the dry propaganda discourse and the idea of the slogans and Xi Jinping's thought and all of these things that I think we're, we've read quite a bit about already, but how does Xi's image get sold to younger people and to various consumers of social media online? It's through creation of somewhat um, of a warmer kind of personable imagery of a leader that we haven't really seen in the previous era. Uh, so, but to start with, um, beyond this imagery, you know, to, to start with the official media, what we see is just increasing mentions of President Xi, much higher mentions of his name, as we've seen from the China Media Project research in Tiangang and Hong Kong, this idea that he's just been mentioned a lot more than any leader in the reform era, right? Uh, so this is Xi, and these are all the reform era leaders. In the beginning, we have Mao Zedong, Hua Gongheng, so just the difference is quite startling when it comes to his pre predecessors in the reform period. And the titles that he's been uh, he's been given are also quite amazing, right? And when it comes to just official titles, Ning Xiu, the latest thing you've all probably heard about, a leader of the highest magnitude, uh, this title has not been granted to any leader in the reform period e either. So there is this idea of kind of glorification that goes al alongside with official media propaganda. Um, but when it comes to the personable image, we see Xi as you know, eating and talking to local workers, uh, Xi as a class leader, that was one of the most popular pieces actually, I think some of you may have seen it, a Peng Pai reporter wrote this piece linking China kind of to a class essentially, and a good class needs a strong leader, and Xi is like a class leader, is also the right leader for the country, so it was a little bit cheesy and a bit, you know, a cute language that's used, and you see him smiling to students, this piece um, has won a lot of praise from officials and young people alike, and the journalist got a huge bonus. Uh, from his editors for this piece. So I don't know, you know <laughs> what happened, but it was a big deal apparently. Uh, so you see this kind of piece is appearing and, and motivating other journalists to write similar stories. So the more you can be sophisticated and fun when it comes to reporting on your leader, the more benefit you might get, the more promotion you might get. As of course, if you're careful enough to make it also an official message about his skills and um, his accomplishments. <coughs> so down to earth. Um, and uh, of course the names like Sida Da and various sort of uh, cuter names that are not just Ling Xiu, but they're also added in our common vocabulary and on various social media apps help to create this warmer imagery that is talked about. Um, and the creation of a more multifaceted persona as well. Here is C reading literature, right? All the books he's read both in Western, by Western uh, authors but also Chinese authors and how he had to walk uh, something like 15 kilometers to a local village when he was w living in a small town just to pick up those books. That's how dedicated he is to literature, right? So the idea of creating this very, uh, you know, interesting, multifaceted uh, leadership-like persona, which is attractive to more people, I think. And the second facet of that is interactivity, which I think is actually very new, and it's very much a product of social media. So here is an app that allows you to follow Xi Jinping. You can see exactly where he went and what he's doing there, so you can track your leader. And there are many competitors to this app, so apparently the service is popular. You know, you can go to another app and see, you know, about his domestic travels, and there are more and less detailed reports, including behind the scenes pictures uh, of his visits, as well as the foreign visitors, uh, dignitaries to China, such as Prime Minister Modi and his very passionate visit to Xi'an, 
Uh, but a lot of media are now encouraged to provide this back of story accounts, whereas in the past we've never seen such detailed accounts of leaders' travels. It was very much kind of a, a staged process. You don't have this sort of uh, glorification, you don't have really any fun fact about it either. It was something that was only done on stage. And uh, most recently, this idea of interactivity has reached a new level uh, of potential success uh, at the 19th Party Congress, where we see uh, this platform created by People's Daily, where one could sign on and essentially chat with party delegates, and you can be on chat with them, and you can also have your name appear next to President C. So just the idea is, of course, it's a ritual, so it's not really like you're chatting directly with them, but the fact that you're able to pretend to be chatting or to even kind of imagine the idea of being part participant in the, in the Congress is something new and fun. And then, of course, there's the clapping app uh, that was created by Tencent, <laughs> where uh, netizens were judged and uh, encouraged to compete on how fast they clap uh, to President Xi's speech. So it's about the intensification of clapping or the speed of clapping, and you, know, you can potentially win something. Some, a lot of these apps actually urge you to participate because you can win Kindles, you can also win vouchers to restaurants and apple-picking places. So there are all kinds of different funny pragmatic sort of uh, almost marketing-like strategies that are used to encourage people to participate in this sort of uh, product. So while we hear so much about those various uh, drier type linguistic devices and uh, slogans and posters, keep in mind that that's only part of the story. You know, that's what we see and that's often covered in Western media, but what's happening on social media platforms is a little bit different and really I think similar to Western marketing strategies that one could use at a company. It's not just a political uh, kind of uh, legitimation tool, you can observe it, I think, almost anywhere. Where somebody's trying to gain influence, they create more interactive platforms, right? Or they try to create a better image, a warmer image of a leader. It's not particularly Chinese or particularly authoritarian or political, I would say. It's more a business strategy. And the last one, perhaps, is a little bit counterintuitive, the idea of globalization of propaganda. I brought it up because especially now, since in DC there's so much talk about China's foreign influence operations and uh, also the soft versus sharp power that China is exercising right overseas. But a lot of these soft power operations or resources devoted to it are actually aimed also at domestic audiences. They're really sold to domestic audience. As China is being projected as a leader uh, in the world, it's something fairly, I think, new. Uh, and it's been done quite skillfully through three different ways that I've, I've spotted at least. The first is through just global reporting by Chinese new, news outlets, so foreign correspondents reporting the world back to China. Uh, the second one is the creation of more nationalistic cultural products, films, and so forth that position China at the center of the world or a particular region. And lastly, there's indirect promotion when we see coverage of China's soft power efforts appear in glorified vision, uh, version in uh, traditional Chinese media reporting domestically, but also when voices of nationalists overseas or students who are patriotic are being kind of amplified and reported on in Chinese media as well. So they're picked up and then they're kind of reborn, so to speak, uh, domestically. So, when it comes to the foreign correspondents, uh, they're telling the China <coughs> story, right? Uh, John Gu Gusha, the campaign, of course, many of you have heard about uh, Xi Jinping's slogan of simply telling better China stories, which has been accompanied by huge investments into uh, Chinese media abroad. So unlike the Western media outlets that are shrinking, their foreign correspondent bureaus, uh, China is only expanding and has become one of the biggest uh, players when it comes to uh, reporting in Africa, for instance, uh, based in Nairobi, but also Xinhua, for instance, has 102 bureaus right around the world, and this number is again expanding. So where are those stories going? Some of them are going to global audiences, but many of them are going directly to Chinese consumers. And what kind of stories are coming out? They are the stories that some scholars refer to that have a China peg. So of course they position China in a particular light uh, and in a particular way um, in the world, right? So a lot of sensitive issues don't get covered. If we think about tensions amongst Chinese companies and local companies, say in Africa, or labor standards, environmental issues, they don't really tend to be highlighted in those reports, but we do see all the infrastructure that's being built and all the good things that come out of this cooperation that's sold back to Chinese audiences. Uh, we also see a certain <coughs> interesting framing happening when it comes to reporting on global issues, right? Or even Western democracy. So oftentimes the reporting on sort of the tumultuous democ democratic process, the kind of weaker institutions, that are inflexible and capable of dealing with crises, it's framed against more stable, malleable, and efficient institutions in China, right? So it's not so surprising that recently we've seen a report that argued that Chinese citizens have more faith and trust in their institutions than do American citizens and Western citizens and other democracies. They're often being sold this frame and often sold uh, the idea of comparisons, like look at this other case and see how well we're doing in contrast to um, the other examples you might be you know, reading about. So I think it's a very effective way, and we see it in a lot of different forms of discourse, online and traditional media, but also through various discussions among scholars and so forth. Uh, so in, in addition to this China peg or reporting of China, 
which uh, we see through authors like CVTN and Xinhua. We see products like Wolf Warrior 2. I don't know how many of you have watched this film. Some of you have, right? The positioning of China is at the center of Africa, right? Overtaking the US by far. A very glorified image through a famous actor, and it's kind of a blockbuster like Hollywood film, essentially. Was it aimed at domestic audiences? Partially, but it was supposed to be a global success, right? It was a soft power product, but it was one of the most popular films in China itself. So it actually did much better, I think, in, in domestic China than overseas. And it suggests that there is this hunger for these types of stories. There's actually a high demand for creation of more cultural products like it, and for more stories about China's role in the world, not just about China's domestic politics. So when it doesn't work out so much directly, there's also, there are also indirect channels. As you see here, this is just a billboard of China's celebrities and various Chinese people you see here in Times Square. I'm sure many of you have heard of how much money have China has put into putting those billboards in there to attract attention, to soft power too. Has it worked? Many argue you know, from my interviews that it was a bit of a failure or it didn't do so well, but it's been advertised and promoted also on domestic Chinese media channels. So the fact that you're able to put up a billboard in the middle of Times Square in New York is, is a way to suggest that, hey, we're powerful, you know, this is possible, and we're doing really well. It's a symbol, even though it might not attract you know, a large audience or maybe nobody's looking up at that billboard in particular when passing by in New York. And uh, I think the most interesting uh, movement, perhaps that something is probably going to expand, is this idea of glorifying nationalistic voices overseas. They're actually homegrown or bottom-up voices. They're not being manufactured uh, by any media outlets. This is a picture with the national flag campaign. This is a, an Australian PhD student who started in 2014, and it went completely viral with many students taking pictures with their flag across the globe, right? The idea of saying that we're still uh, you know, patriotic, we care about China. And uh, this campaign was picked up in Chinese domestic media and advertises patriotism uh, of post-90s generation. And one of the quotes they use is that, how dare you say that you know, post-90s are not patriotic? We are patriotic and we say so loudly. You know, we love China and we say so loudly. So this idea of, of you know, love for your motherland amongst the youngest people who are just college students is very powerful, I think. And it's a powerful message to bring back home and to <coughs> sell it in domestic media. So that's something that's just another example. But there are many cases like this, and I think we'll see more and more linkages between the bottom-up nationalistic discourse promoted through various social media channels and the more top-down you know, media coverage in China. So while all the strategies have been uh, somewhat sophisticated and uh, some would argue also successful to an extent, I would also say that they create certain spaces or cracks uh, for more critical reporting and more um, creative resistance online. So even though it's aimed at propaganda, it also creates new platforms, new plateaus for creative uh, dissent, but not so much a radical dissent. It's something that I also discuss in the book. It's very subtle, it's very much um, working uh, in a dance with the party as opposed to something that goes against the party state <coughs> itself. So it's not dissidents, there are various creative voices that appear in traditional media and social media. So in traditional media, as an example of how propaganda opened up uh, the spaces, Peng Pai, as I mentioned, the paper, uh, it's, it's become credible precisely because of its reporting, right? It's more uh, serious journalistic standards and it's investigated quite a few serious cases from the Tianjin blast to the kindergarten scandal that many of you have heard about the abuse, the sexual abuse of one of the largest kindergarten companies in China. It's been covered by not only Feng Pai, but a number of other media. So someone, some outlets like Feng Pai pushes other outlets to also engage, to compete, and to create more exciting content because they want to stay alive, they want to attract audiences. So despite this talk of complete death of investigative reporting, I would argue that the pockets are still there. There are still some people trying to practice it very cautiously. And uh, precisely because platforms need legitimacy, they often take advantage of that and create more exciting content as a way to sell legitimacy, essentially. And in addition, outside of this mainstream kind of uh, traditional media channels, we see other voices that compete with uh, traditional media. For example, the nonfiction writing boom, something that never pays, I think. In the West, you cannot really make much money as a nonfiction writer online. But in China, some of these um, actors actually got quite rich, and they set up their own startups that encourage various people to write stories and to get tipped uh, by the readers. You can get money back, and you can write more stories. So it's a very interesting uh, sort of uh, new trend. But the most important part about it is they're essentially human interest in depth stories. So they're not reports in a journalistic style, but they tackle various social issues that journalists used to tackle. And many of the same actors are present on those platforms. The same journalists who used to work for Southern Weekly and other liberal outlets have now transformed uh, their writing into this nonfiction style. So they're another kind of little glimmer, I guess, of hope when it comes to creativity in a more challenging environment, and it's precisely afforded by social media. So th in addition to that, of course, we see satire. The satire itself is not dead. You know, media activism in China is still there when it comes to social media. Here is a glimpse of that on the, on the left. Uh, people indoctrination, you know, rats watching President Xi's speech. It was a very fun meme that went all viral. And here on the right, you just see this 
you know, little kids uh, <laughs> quietly watching uh, the speech as well. And of course, that went uh, pretty viral as well. And of course, the famous uh, Jiang Zemin Yan <laughs> was a big, the big meme, right? The idea that even the highest leader is a little bit bored or tired or whatever the interpretation, maybe just getting old, <laughs> <laughs> depending on one's uh, point of view. But the meme went very, very quickly uh, viral. And of course, it's about how people comment on it. So even though it might not mean much to us, the way that the comments, the creative comments that you suggest that there's a lot of you know, playfulness in response to this increasing emphasis on one leader, there's kind of a pushback. It's like, this is a little bit too much, so let's play around with this. Let's create new ways of uh, dealing with this sort of um, movement, propaganda movement. So this, of course, gets censored. So it's not that they'll stay alive forever. They get censored uh, eventually. But just a glimpse of that is, is fun, and they stay alive in people's consciousness, right? They create new ones once these get censored. So it's something that over a cat and mouse game that we've seen over the years. It's nothing new, but it's still there, um, even in this more censored media environment. And even the globalization of propaganda has created new fascinating spaces for providing alternative discourse when it comes to China's role in the world. So this last slide here, it's a company uh, called Shizia Show China Globus that's a part of Caixin. So Caixin magazine has a startup within it that's run by Michael Anti, a very liberal intellectual. I think many of you may have heard of him, but he started this app essentially hiring a lot of um, Chinese exchange students. They're working as freelancers. They're paid something from, uh, from about $200 and up depending on their story, to write about various things that they see in the countries where they're living. And they, they have a huge network, a web that expands to countries like North Korea, Iran, Russia. Basically, they're all over the world, and they have these pockets you know, of students who are willing to write because it's pretty good income, and they get publicity from it. So it's been quite successful, and as Michael Ante himself mentioned uh, to, to me last summer, is that traditional kind of media space reporting Chinese politics to Chinese citizens have obviously shrunk. It's become harder to do this kind of work. But when it comes to reporting the world to China, it's a new opportunity, and it's much less sensitive because it's not directly speaking about China. But the kind of issues they've reported on include, for example, this picture, access to internet in Iran, like in censored regimes. You know, how do, how do people access internet in their spaces? It's not about China, but it's about other countries. You know, how does one survive? What kind of protests take place? in various contexts. And of course, many of these global issues are very sensitive for traditional media to tackle. So I think it's a really fascinating um, new movement. I don't know how long it's going to last, <laughs> but their web is really large. They're growing, and many students are joining. They have a huge database, and they can tap into any student <laughs> any time and ask them to write a story. So it's almost like a media enterprising company, but it's run on exchange students. So interesting movement. And even the English-speaking um, outlets, for example, Six Tone, that many of you might be familiar with out of Shanghai, it's part of the same group as Pang Pai. They've been writing not directly controversial stories, but very interesting investigative in-depth reports about various human interest issues. For example, um, the healthcare industry. There was a big report on oversized hospital that won an award in 2017 for best explanatory reporting. Of course, these stories are in English, so they're not aimed at Chinese audiences per se, but most savvy netizens can read English. And if one is really interested, they can always access, I think, this article. So it's not that, that hard for them to read it if they want to. So as you see, all of these tactics um, are, of propaganda, kind of improvisation, they're all sophisticated. And I think you know, they're responding to the digital age, but there's also digital culture and media professionals that respond to those tactics. So it's a constant dance that we notice back and forth. The dance that I refer to in my book as uh, guarded improvisation that's always guarded by the state, but there's always movement and fluidity when it comes to um, this media politics and the relationship between the society and the state and managing these media spaces. So I'll conclude there, and uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to discuss any of this, including censorship. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Maria. That was uh, fascinating. Um, lots there, Kaiser. Absolutely. <laughs> um, welcome your commentary before we have a few questions. Yeah, I, I'm afraid that those of you who are um, maybe hoping for a lively sparring match here are going to be sorely <laughs> Sorely disappointed because there's basically no daylight between uh, Maria's very empirically grounded and very nuanced and, uh, and uh, very well thought through approach and my purely anecdotal and impressionistic view. Uh, but I, it, it really accords very much with what I understand. But I think that, that we would be remiss here if we only stayed on this topic of, of, of strategies, of media strategies in, in the Xi Jinping era and didn't look at some of the, the, the work on which this is founded, on, the, on this, this, which Marie has been, I spent the last couple of days very much steeped in her very impressive body of work, uh, especially her book, and a forthcoming article, and I'm, like, I'm sorry, what the title of that article is gonna be, it's looking actually at the Chinese and Russian okay, uh, so Contesting authoritarianism, critical journalists in China and Russia, so it's comparing the two different right. societies. Right, yeah. uh, but the work that I'm referring to uh, is, is really about one of the core ways in which uh, critical journalists 
and the and officialdom, critical journalists in the state interact. And I think that, that you develop this idea very much sort of in reaction to uh, a, a kind of tired narrative that you heard again and again, which focuses on, of course, the, 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 the more obvious tools of media policy in China, which of course are censorship and propaganda. And we've looked at some of these things here in, in the style of propaganda, but uh, the other piece of this, which I think is just really, I think, advances our understanding of, of the relationship between media and, and, and the role of media, really, of critical media in China, uh, is something we should be talking about, right? And that is something you describe as kind of a fluid collaboration. And before I, I let you, you, you tell us all about it, it just is astonishing to me how it not just dovetails, I mean, it, it, it corresponds so perfectly with these ideas that I had been sort of developing all along since my early days of graduate school. And I, I'm wondering if your ideas, you think those are sort of extendable beyond just critical journalists to the critical intelligentsia more broadly, or even just the intelligentsia more broadly, and its relationship with state power, because I've always believed that that relationship is the engine of history, even of politics, but of, of history, the relationship between the pen and the sword, between the state and, and, and intellectuals. Um, so tell us about this, this idea of fluid collaboration. What, what do you mean by this? And maybe give us some examples of how this works in action. Sure, thank you, uh, Kaiser. So uh, the idea of fluid collaboration it speaks to a little bit towards the end of the presentation when I talked about these various spaces uh, or cracks in the system that allow for some uh, more critical, more alternative frames uh, to come out in Chinese media discourse. So what I looked at at the book is that I looked at critical journalists more broadly, and I surveyed a number of media outlets that engage primarily in investigative journalism, but also in-depth reporting on contentious social issues over the past decade. And uh, when I looked at their relationship with the state, the dominant framework with, that was heard a lot you know, through Western media reporting, but also through the analysis of kind of intellectuals versus the state relations and authoritarian regimes is often that of a battle. You know, the kind of opposition. The con yeah. the opposition. They contest each other and they go after each other. That's the kind of relationship that we hear about. And we often glorify individuals who do go into that battle, right? Individuals who completely take on the state. So we often hear about Ai Weiwei or you know, other actors who are really um, almost uh, fearless. You know, they're very brave, they're fearless, they're going after. Uh, the top agents of the party. But what happens for the most part, the majority of that sort of space, that the battle takes place uh, in a more of the corners of, this, of the party state, right? On the kind of the edges of it. And I was interested in the edges. I was interested in what's happening on those edges. Are those individuals equally anti-party or are they trying to do something different? Do they believe in the battle head on against the party? Are they simply scared? You know, I was wondering how they work out uh, their strategies and how the state also does and does not tolerate them and why. So what I found is that in addition to this dominant role that I've highlighted today, the dominant role of propaganda, there's been a, a role called uh, supervision through public opinion uh, called Yulun Jiandu in Chinese that uh, has been tolerant of some voices that end up helping policy making by highlighting grievances from below. In addition to disciplining local officials, as we all know it's a huge struggle for central state, but any really you know, decentralized regime to discipline local authorities. So because of these struggles, uh, the regime has granted some of those spaces and roles for journalists to help out essentially, but they still have to serve the party's interests. So you can only help out in certain areas at certain times <laughs> under certain limits, right? So it's not a, it's not a and, and it's very tiered, right? It's I mean, we're tiered. talking about uh, how, how this is very much allowable when the targets are in, in the, the local, local level. right? The local, the sub-provincial level, right. typically. And then it, it, the, the space is narrowed as you approach the apex, mm -hmm. as you approach the, and I, I was noticing this, I mean, as you were talking about the, the copycats of, of, yeah. of the paper, uh, how these were all local mm -hmm. and they were all shuttered, but mm -hmm. Peng Pai, which is central, which mm -hmm. is, 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 is directed to the center, has been allowed to flourish and has allowed to, to do some fairly aggressive mm -hmm. uh, investigative reporting. Mm -hmm. So do you think th th that really accords with your idea? Right? Very much. So, I mean, Peng Pai is also considered to be local in the sense that it's a regional outlet, so it's based out of Shanghai, and it's sponsored by Shanghai authorities. So it's not something that's funded directly by Beijing, it's not a central media outlet. And all more the other, central though, it's more central than the local, right. these tiny localized ones that you know you've seen the copycats of. Uh, so I think the reason for Shanghai to emerge is this kind of center for media, sort of I guess critical media or more in depth, interesting media environment is because it used to be a very conservative media capital. And then once Nanfang Media, Southern Weekly, right, a lot of you have heard of so the South as being more liberal, that space has died out for the most part. That right. media group has really been shrinking. So when the space opened up and we've heard about all those speeches of revitalizing online propaganda, creating new voices uh, that Xi Jinping has made, Shanghai really took advantage of that. Shanghai party officials, propaganda officials said, let's make that the center. Let's invest here, it's a good idea. Yeah. And they've done well and they've been uh, rewarded for it. 
So as a result, Shanghai has become quite powerful, and because of the idea of consuming news only through various apps, you can only read so many information channels, those little you know, uh, actors, they couldn't really make it. It's very hard to attract uh, audiences outside of your little pocket of people in your particular county or town. So Feng Pai kind of took over, and I think it's very difficult to just kind of counter that uh, in the long term. So Maria, the, the work that you did for your book focuses on basically the Hu Jintao era, right? From 2003 until about 2012, right? Yeah, That's but I've done follow-up interviews every year, sure. so I, I do have uh, a sense of where things went right, in the past right, several right. years. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting that that period also really sort of corresponds with the explosion of the internet, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, I, if, I, if I'm remembering correctly, in, say, 2002, on the eve of, of Hu Jintao is actually assuming the presidency, uh, the, the internet penetration level in China was probably under 10% still. I mean, we were still talking about uh, just, just uh, less than, I mean, maybe double digit millions, right? By 2012, I think we had passed 650 million, uh, so we're, we're talking about internet penetration approaching 50% in China, which is really just a, a, an absolute change. Uh, the internet allows more directly targeted segmentation, so mm -hmm. the party is able to, to push its message mm -hmm. uh, more specifically at certain groups, but at the same time, it creates a lot of transparency, uh, permeability, where I can see the messaging that's aimed at segments that I do not belong to. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this seems sort of a double-edged thing. Is it more or less effective at, at, at compartmentalizing its message and, and focusing, because what you want to say to the unwashed masses is not the same as you want to say to the educated urban elites. Mm -hmm. uh, what you want to say to Chinese who have a lot of exposure to the, the outside world and to people who are sort of more internally focused, your, your message to the outside and your message domestically, your, your neighbor message and your, your, uh, your, your external party, uh, outside, outside extra party ma message is different. How's the internet affect? Uh, huge question, yeah. but how's yeah. the internet just? <laughs> well, I think that part of it is not so much uh, playing to different audiences kind of separately, but multiplying the platforms. Right. So instead of having one voice or having just a few newspapers and a TV channel, now we have all sorts of these platforms that I've talked about today, but there are many more. So in essentially, there's more choice, and the idea is to kind of cater to different audiences. So you, if you're a particular member of a certain group, you're not going to go to the other uh, paper. You're not going to read, you know, sure. Raymond Rabah if you're reading Feng Pai, for instance. You're uh -huh. probably going to stick to Feng Pai. So in this case, you're going to consume that information. But if you're reading Raymond Rabah, you're going to read about the Ling Show and all the uh -huh. other slogans as well, and you're going to be attracted by that uh, message. And if you're a younger person who's just consuming those apps and is interested in, you know, the vouchers for apple picking or <laughs> Kindles, et cetera, that you're not going to be probably reading Feng Pai as much. You might be reading that, you know, the stories on those apps. So, so shameful that Chinese people would stay within their own little media bubble. Well, we all do, right? <laughs> That's the yeah. joke. <laughs> it's kind of, yeah, it's, uh, the expectation is, I think in some ways it makes it a little bit easier because if you create more, yeah. you might be able to kind of reach out to more voices. But I guess the downside of that is that you're not quite sure, you know, necessarily who are you capturing. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of, uh, you know, discussion. Is this successful? Is this effective? Um, and what else could be done? So it's not, a, it's not a final note. I think there's probably a lot of people who would uh, who read your, your work, your book, and said, yes, you know, this perfectly well describes media during the Hu Jintao era, where we really see, saw quite a bit of contestation. Uh, it was quite clear. I mean, there were a lot of examples that you looked at in the book. For example, the, the series of mining disasters in the mid 2000s in in Henan, in Shanxi, in Neimong, and then um, I think the Wenzhou earthquake in 2008 was a, was another big case study. But they would probably imagine, and uh, are correctly maybe, that that the space for contestation has constricted really appreciably uh, since 2013, really since 2009, since the liberal turn really began in, in 2009. Uh, but you don't really say that that's the case, right? You say that, that, that the mechanisms are still, they still hold, yeah? Yeah, I mean, the spaces have shrunk, so the number of actors engaged in this sort of uh, activities, you know, the number of media professionals willing to go into in-depth reporting, investigative reporting, has definitely decreased. So not everybody's as daring or willing to mm. enter this kind of job. But at the same time, there's still people who are, and the younger generations don't have the same exposure to previous eras. They don't know what happened before, but to them, this is just what it is. If you want to be a journalist, you have certain restrictions, and you just have to try harder and find new creative ways. So last time I was interviewing journalists who were like 19, 20 years old. You know, they're just starting this career, and they're still excited, and they're still somewhat idealistic. You know, how long that lasts is a question, perhaps, of time, but they're getting even more savvy and also trying to understand how official propaganda works, kind of trying to tackle it back and forth. So so it's, sort of, yeah, yeah. It's, a matter, it's a matter of access, but also new platforms that I mentioned before. There are new different ways to express critique that are not always as obvious to us, or not always linked to investigative journalism. So some of the, the, the features of this mode of collaboration mm -hmm. that I thought were really interesting was, one, that, well, they, they, the, these critical journalists still see themselves 
as insiders. They see themselves as part of the system. They see their contributions as intended to improve governance, that they believe that they have this shared idea of improving governance through uh, what, what you call public opinion oversight. So, but what about, uh, so do, do, do they really see themselves as, as uh, required, as you suggest, to contribute uh, positive what, what, what sort of solutions, right? There, you, 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 you suggest that they, there's this expectation that in their, in their, I mean, I see this, it is a feature, absolutely, of, of Chinese investigative reporting, that you, know, you don't feel like the story is over until they've, they've given you six bullet points of things that can actually be done yeah. to, yeah. now, I mean, what is, how, how do they expect, you know, a 24-year-old reporter to come up with solutions that a, a, an enormous technocratic bureaucracy could can't come up with. <laughs> right. I mean, wh wh why lay this expectation? That and I mean, I'm, I'm tempted to think that it, it isn't sincere, that in fact what you're asking for is for the journalist to signal participation, to signal alignment, mm -hmm. to signal uh, acquiescence. Is that mm -hmm. a yeah, fair so read on that? I mean, the term that they use is constructive reporting, which is a very fluid term as well. You know, what does it mean to be constructive? And there's several ways in which constructiveness is expressed in, in media reporting. One way is indeed to provide solutions, but where do the solutions come from? They come from official voices and experts. So you see a lot of expert interviews. So when it comes to coal mining, for instance, in the past decade, uh, Taitin magazine did a lot of investigations and they suggested that the coal mining sector should be commercialized. Mm. Where did they get this kind of advice from? The one official uh, <laughs> in the ministry was interested in that. He had one agenda and this official was quoted uh, constantly. So I found this guy later on and I interviewed him, but he changed his mind. <laughs> point, he was no longer supporting the agenda of Taiting, but it was just interesting how this particular name appeared because they couldn't say it themselves, you know? Uh -huh. They couldn't directly say, we suggest this because it sounds, you know, too sensitive and too blatant. So that's one way is to provide this kind of to expert solutions, but the other way is to suggest that the government is already taking care of it. So a lot of Chinese reports, if you read them, including more critical reports, they start out with what's already being done to fix the problem. Uh -huh. And that's something that's quite distinct from Western reporting. Like, you're not going to see what's being fixed yet until things are maybe underway and maybe weeks, weeks later, right? So that's kind of a different strategy of sort of appealing to the state. It's like you're already taking care of it, but these are things you could do more of. So it's sort of, a, again, a very collaborative, uh, subtle way to uh, present critique. Well, let's talk about the case of Chengding Zhixia, the Under the Dome, this documentary that was done by an ex-CCTV investigative journalist mm -hmm. herself, yeah, uh, that, right, who uh, did this, this very hard-hitting documentary that was seen by probably an upwards of 70 million people in China before it was suddenly taken offline. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so walk us through how this is an example. I think I think it, it fits pretty well into how, how this actually works. But, yeah, I mean, because she clearly had collaboration. I mean, there were uh, you know sure. MEP officials who appeared on camera. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, so she, she's a fascinating example also because she was a journalist and a producer before, and she's extremely well read, and I've interviewed her in the book quite a bit as well. But in this particular case, uh, the way it was done is that she appealed to a policy area that was already of interest to officials, so mm -hmm. environmental issues of, of high relevance to Chinese state, of course, there were many statements made before her film came out, but yes, if you watch the film, it's almost like a film that walks you through various attempts and voices from the policy apparatus as well. So she's not just presenting a story of grievance, she's presenting a personal story of her own daughter being born with a you know, potential illness, I think, and uh, how that she's may born. or may not have been related, not, to, yeah, pollution, related right? to, to pollution, but also then she goes into this expertly accounts uh, from various locales and ministries to suggest that things should be done better and how and why they're not and what's being done about it. So it's very much, again, the constructive uh, critique here uh, of approach that appeared in her film. And the response by the state, I think, really mirrors a lot of responses I've observed in other cases. On the one hand, the film was censored, right? And sure. uh, harshly so, you can no longer watch the film. On the other hand, there's been more policy statements and responses to the issue since the film came out. Mm -hmm. So is it linked directly to the film? Of course, we can't uh, you know, trace the causality directly, but the idea is that it raised certain issues. It, it's obviously part of the public conscience. They have to do something about it. So censorship and responsiveness are almost linked together when it comes to engaging with any sensitive matters and reporting in China. In I, I also thought, solution. yeah, that the timing of the censorship was seemed carefully calibrated to mm -hmm. me, that they, mm -hmm. they allowed it to reach a certain number of people and they, they, they understood exactly. You know who it would reach first, and you know what what stakeholders it would actually touch first before they pulled it. And it was it seemed to me quite yeah, and that that's well, your sense as well. I think it's also trying to wait out, understand the public response. So in many of these cases, 
when a certain report is published, it's not immediately censored. But the idea is to s wait and see who is responding to it, right. how do people react, right. because mm -hmm. there's an obsession with studying public opinion in China, right? Mm. They're <laughs> studying it vigorously. So th the idea of understanding, you know, who is responding to what helps them better craft a response to this message. Mm -hmm. So censorship will still happen. There's no way about it, you know, they're around it. They're always going to censor the censor message, but they might do it sooner or later. There might be a day or hours or maybe even two days in some cases mm -hmm. for a sensitive mm -hmm. report to stay on. So you were born in Latvia and spent a lot of your childhood in, in uh, another CIS state in, in uh, the, well, I guess Latvia was never a CIS state. So it was part of the Soviet Union. It was part of the Soviet <laughs> Union, right. Uh, but in, in, in uh, Kyrgyzia, right, in Kyrgyzstan, uh, you're, you're a native Russian speaker as well. So you actually, in your book, and I think this was really fascinating, you did quite a bit of contrast between uh, Russian, well, but you looked at both uh, Russia in uh, the period of Glasnost, and then you looked at Russia in, in the Putin era and found that maybe during Gorbachev's lifetime there was still this sort of collaboration, this fluid collaboration pattern. They were participants in the dance along with the state. But it's very much not that way now, right? Right, it's not I mean, at all. Look at Navalny was just arrested yesterday. And, uh, right, in uh, Russia we see, we see more of that battlefield, so to speak, the two opposition forces you know, coming together. So the, the voices that are most critical that are still you know, residing in Russia tend to be far more critical than the Chinese voices in China. So the interviews that are conducted with those investigative reporters, they don't have an idea of improving governance mm -hmm. necessarily or collaborating with the party, or in this case Putin, or becoming you know, allies of the state. Their idea is really to contribute to some radical change uh, over time, and the sooner the better. So it's a very different vision from the Chinese reporters, and it's a different vision from the Soviet journals as well, as you mentioned. So in, in Gorbachev's time, uh, he, uh, you know, I think you suggest in your book that he invested them with so much power that they actually overwhelmed the state. Right, so he invested them with a lot of power, but also fewer restrictions. So one of the ways to manage this relationship, of course, is to constantly adapt your restrictive mechanisms as well. So I talked today about propaganda, and you won't <coughs> heard too much about censorship, so I cut that a little bit short. But there's, off, there's constant re-adaptation of control and different pressures on journalists to keep them in check. In the Soviet period, it was almost like the doors opened up, and the, the pressures have really laid off to the point that they were able to say many radical things that they weren't able to say for decades. So it was a very different uh, dynamic, and I think uh, the Soviet model has been a lesson, I think, for China, obsessively studying the Soviet yeah, Union uh, yeah. as a, a non-model, an anti-model, so to right. speak. Mm -hmm. so can, can we just follow up on that? Because I yeah. think it's very critical. Um, one thing that strikes me in watching this dance <laughs> over <laughs> some number of years yeah. is, let's call it the genius of the parties, the Chinese Communist Party's solution to a lot of this has been to understand the evolution from information control, which I think they quickly realized had real limits, limits. especially in an internet age, to um, let's call it, you know, sort of uh, persuasion to what I would call now information shaping. Mm -hmm. In other words, the party seeks to create a narrative before there is a narrative. Right. <laughs> and then push it out along among all these mm -hmm. platforms that you've highlighted. Um, we don't have to like it, but it is effective, I think. Uh, can right. you comment on your sense of the evolution? of that of process? How, how effective it is? Right. Well, how effective, but also how it developed. When did the light go on right. for them mm -hmm. to make that shift? Mm -hmm. To start thinking about sort of the battlefield of public opinion. Right. right. Um, I think the light went off quite a while ago. It's not just the internet age. Even looking at the Hu Jintao era, you know, starting out quite early in the Hu Jintao era and researching the subject, there was always this discussion that we have to capture and uh, sort of charm public opinion. It was never about just control. Mm -hmm. There was always this idea that we have to understand public opinion first, and then we have to try to understand how to align the public with our interests mm -hmm. and uh, to work together. And that's something that I think you don't see as, as close up uh, in the Russian case under Putin, this obsessive kind of trying to, uh, attempt to understand public opinion to really cater to it in some ways. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a very interesting feature of the Chinese uh, communist system and Chinese political system as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that started earlier, but I think the internet was almost like a real red light. It's like we really have to do something more innovative. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that light has come off sort of late in the Hu era, but Xi Jinping has understood the challenge uh, more acutely and he's been doing more about it. Mm -hmm. He's been more sharp in proclaiming, you know, in making various statements to um, essentially stimulate this movement, these platforms and mm -hmm. individuals to become more creative um, in pursuing, shaping, and channeling public opinion. The media is surnamed party under C. Yeah. Uh, what I'm, I'm, I remember back in a time when, you know, this, this is the, the, the year two, year three of the Weibo age, where you couldn't go a week without seeing some high-flying public official brought low in, by, by his malfeasance, always he, never <laughs> heard, uh, captured on, on by, by a, a, a clever netizen with a camera at the right time, you know, 
the guy with the watch, for right. example, the brother with the watch. Or, right. <laughs> uh, there were all sorts of uh, cases like that. There was uh, anyway. That 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 those days seem to be gone. There, there's not as much willingness, I think, or responsiveness to that kind of ground yeah. up uh, yeah. internet-based public uh, yeah. oversight. Yeah. Public yeah. oversight. Yeah. Uh, what's the space look like now? How, how constricted is it? I mean, are there still, uh, what are the no-fly zones that have been, there have always been no-fly zones. There all, there's all, you weren't able to do Taiwan independence or Tibetan independence or, 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 or Xinjiang or, uh, of course, no, nobody, nothing calling for, you know, plural, pluralist elections. Right. What are the new no-fly zones? Well, I just wanted to make one, one point before I get to the no-fly zones, the idea of anti-corruption, uh, this sort of watchdog by the public versus watchdog by the state. So the anti-corruption campaign in some ways replaced, I think, those uh, pictures and Weibo posts. Mm -hmm. And essentially it's more of a top-down uh, battle, but it also engages societal voices. So what we see is media being invited to help, if that's their own phrasing, to <coughs> essentially investigate officials that are already under investigation or under, <laughs> you know, certain uh, <laughs> oversight by the party. So it's instead of them being the first to get the story, the scoop, they're the ones helping to expand the scoop, if that makes sense. Well, oh, it's more just like, here's some red meat, well, right? right. Go check it, it out. A little right. bit, you know? mm -hmm. But they, they've never been able to, you know, do this kind of work before. It's pretty exciting for some people, even though they know it's a game and it's not something that's really as genuine as they would like it to be. But I think it's interesting how this anti corruption kind of uh, struggle has moved more away from the bottom up to more of a top down orchestrated campaign that still involves society but in a more kind of manufactured uh, manner. I think it's important too to highlight the levels if you will yeah, up levels. and down yeah. that line of communication yeah. so yeah. clearly you had I think an episode probably in the 2013-14 right after the campaign largely got kicked off where really central discipline inspection people were starting to say to the leadership I think we better run this, you know, we, we better yeah. control it. And then you have clear instances where Wang Qishan takes the case file and hands it to Hu Shuli and says, go run this story for me. Um, and then that percolates down to what you were saying for people to go out and, and turn over more rocks, if you will, right. uh, which is a pretty sophisticated approach, really. Um, so it is sort of a, like everything else, um, top-level design yeah. seems to be the, yeah, top -level the theme. And there's a new app I was reading about yesterday where people are encouraged to not spy, but kind of surveil you know, neighbors and their communities, and then they get tipped for it. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, a, it's a higher tip than for 50 Cent Army, so it's like a higher than Mumao Dong or something else. So it's interesting, because it's almost like a similar idea. It's like, well, you can do the surveillance, you can look around, but you're gonna report to us. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't just go to Weibo, it goes to a particular channel right. that's controlled by the state. To the right filter. Exactly, yeah. to the right filter. So it's an interesting kind of a more controlled, maybe in some ways more sophisticated way of encouraging people to, to do that work. Mm -hmm. You're probably familiar with Danny Stockman and, yes. her, and her, the work that she's done. Uh, she's at, at, at Leiden, right? Yeah, Is that she's, correct? she's in Berlin now. Oh, she's in Berlin now, okay. Uh, she's looked at, at the impact of the commercialization of media. Uh, is this part of the work that you've done? You've looked at maybe in, in, in this era, uh, we've seen a, a reduction in commercial media. Mm -hmm. it's, it's quite pronounced. Mm -hmm. Some of it has been for commercial reasons, I mean, as the rest of the world has, has suffered. Uh, some of it is not. How has this played into constriction in the, in the space uh, available to, to critical media? Um, so my work in the book, it builds sort of on her work because she discovered that commercialized media is more generally a little bit more open, but at the same time I think she argued that the general line of sort of um, argument or the kind of general lines they pursue are not that different. So it's mm. almost like you have this more commercialized outfits that right. look more liberal, but they're actually not that much better or more credible than the party outfits. But mm. people prefer to look at them. Mm. So in some ways, we're seeing some of it playing out Peng now Pai. in a sort of a reverse way. So mm. you see Peng Pai is a state-owned uh, state outlet, but it looks commercialized. So they adapt the kind of the facade, the, the image mm -hmm. of a commercialized <coughs> outlet, uh. but they're funding it uh, with official money. So I think there's still this kind of idea of playing into that desire for an alternative product. Right. which happens to be more commercialized. So I think you see that too with the advent of the sort of um, Xi Jinping fanboy site as well, which yeah. is of course all staged by um, the propaganda department. Exactly, of the party, but it looks so. like it's something else. They try to adapt Correct. different names yeah, and so. uh, to stay away from the official media kind of uh, interpretation of bias. Right, should we take some questions? Yes, why don't we turn to our audience and uh, as usual for CSIS practice, uh, please wait to be called on and then do identify yourself and do try to confine your question to a question. Um, we're going to start right up front here. Microphones. Hi, uh, I'm Chen Weihua, China Daily. So, since I'm, I think I'm implicated in your talk, so <laughs> I, I would make a very quick comment. I think, you know, as you mentioned also, I mean, it's uh, easier, I mean, for people to dismiss Chinese news media as propaganda. But, uh, you know, as you touched on, I mean, as, 
interesting, and people talk about Chinese economy as a predatory. But Chris actually last week in Florida actually said Chinese economy is not a predatory. I think it's a very honest uh, scholar, you know, commenting. I mean, the China hand. I think that the Chinese media landscape is far more complicated. What you discussed has been there for decades, I would say. So, but that's only maybe I don't know one percent, ten percent of the picture. It's not like you know ev people believe everybody in this town wake up uh, want to know the Russian investigation or whole America want to know that. No, they want to know NBA, national yeah. no, NFL, or other. And the Chinese too, ninety percent maybe more people want to wake up to know what's happening to the housing prices, the medical care, you know, other education, not you know the what you just referred to. So that's the larger picture I want to say. I would also, you know, want to say, I mean, a lot of people you mentioned the paper, you know, I'm from Shanghai, so those people, the leaders there are my fellow schoolmates, the students the union, the food I know today, so I know them well, very well. They are very professional yeah. journalists, as professional the paper, you know, people you find here, so I have a lot, a lot of respect to them. And, uh, you know, the other thing is, I think, you know, I think the Chinese media also obviously have its own problem, I mean, that's, I mean, but the U.S. media is the same. I mean, I just want to raise one example. I don't know you read the recent article by Quartz about China Daily fabricating this, uh, you know, quotes by Davos Mayor, you know, about it turned out to be false news. I mean, we, I have actually, you know, a comment from uh, the Davos Mayor's office because the Davos Mayor was speaking German and his aide translated English. So our reporter did the, the reporting based on English version, and it was totally accurate. So the mayor now sent a letter say, your reporting is totally professional, in no way fabricated anything, it's not a fake news, it's only technical, you know, little difference, it's not altered the meeting. So, but this the uh, Quartz News reported in, you know, run by CBS, AP, probably VOA, other news organizations. So the US news media is powerful. But you know, I mean, that's no doubt. I mean, the Chinese media uh, is new. Uh, I mean, it's a learning process. I'm not What's trying your, to defend. Let's get to the question. It. Yeah, the question is really, you know, because I could make the same argument uh, whether you know the U.S. news, US, U.S. government is just more skillful in shaping propaganda, you know, than the Chinese government. So that's the only difference. Is this a question? Yeah, yes. that's the okay. question. All right. <laughs> Which is the sure. more skillful? Okay. Okay. okay, I mean, first of all, I wanted to respond to your point very briefly uh, in terms of the 10% or the full picture. Of course, the picture is much more diverse, right? There are many, many outlets. There are many more platforms than this. This was kind of a snippet of just different adaptations, I would say, that I highlighted in my research uh, about state adaptations. So I'm not looking at all commercial products. But of course, as you say, most people are interested in their local news or entertainment or housing prices and practical issues. And I think a lot of these platforms play into that interest because a lot of this content is not that political. A lot of it actually speaks to everyday concerns of Chinese citizens. And I think that's a smart strategy of persuasion, if you will, whatever word you call it. That's what is being done also by official media platforms. The idea of you know, adjusting themselves to public demands uh, for yeah, everyday concerns. Uh, and the idea of uh, propaganda in the US being more sophisticated. Um, the words we use them, we have to be, of course, careful with them. But I think what's happening with every government, they use various persuasion strategies. And what I described here is not necessarily very Chinese or authoritarian. That's what I mentioned at the beginning, is that many countries use digital media platforms. They use interac interactive features and creative content. So I think the difference is that there is a lot more state investment into these platforms in China. There's a lot more money that's funded by the state. Um, and there is more control of the platforms themselves, right? So there's less diversity when it comes to different ownership structures. But as far, as far as goals are concerned or you know, influencing the message, of course, every government wants to influence the message through various strategic tools. So in that sense, you know, I agree with you. But, you know, she didn't set out to offer a comprehensive picture of the entire Chinese media landscape. That's not what, what we asked her to do, and that's not what her book sets out to do. It, it's to look at media, the, the, the relationship specifically between critical journalism and the state media. And I think she presents a far more nuanced picture in her reporting than what you would typically encounter in the, the, the Western media that you're so quick to condemn. Okay. Next question. Yes, ma'am. Fascinating, thank you. And uh, Mr. Guo, I read many of your articles and that's Beijing and thank you for those <laughs> in the old days. Um, I'm Ruth Kurtzbauer, a retired US diplomat, served various decades in China and I was a junior press officer in 84 when we were mimeographing our limited press statements and I'm, I must say the Chinese uh, media outreach much more sophisticated than we were then. But my, my question is more on the new media 
that I'm less familiar with. For the uh, journalists that are um, writing for the various apps you explained to us, are these freelancers? Uh, do they propose their own stories? Uh, how do they know what, what the app wants? What happens if maybe the story is not what the editor hoped for? Are there any repercussions? So that's one little sort of nuts and bolts question. And the second in, uh, is I was on uh, just a temporary duty in China a few months ago. And at night, I would relax and I would watch television, old media. And um, I always enjoyed the various uh, uh, telenovela, what's the English word, um, soap operas, especially the historical ones. But the historical ones, not the old ancient ones, but you know, Second World War preview or before, there's always a message. And I was wondering, are those still popular tools or is this old media that only appeals to people over 60 like me? <laughs> So great question about the first one about the the process, I guess, of making those digital apps. You know, who works there and how it works. Uh, these are not freelancers; they actually have contracts, so they're not just staying in their homes kind of freelancing. They they come to an office usually, and the office, the ones I visited, at least have sort of a startup-like look to them. It's more industrial-looking; they're kind of fashionable, and they don't look like an official media outfit per se. So, but also official media itself is changing its image, right? They they look a lot more modern these days. So they they try to improvise the stories in a sense to see how audience reacts. So they get more bonuses if the story is very popular, or if someone, you know, a story does well, like for example that story about CDP and the class leader, but there are many other little snippets. If they do well, they get a little bit more money, and uh, they get more rewarded, right? So they kind of test it out to see how the audience reaction. Uh, Buzzfeed. Yeah, Buzzfeed model, <laughs> yeah, they're basically Buzzfeed. <laughs> yeah, so it's very, com very competitive as well, and uh, they're paid, I don't know exactly how much, but quite well. And this job allows for some creativity, but of course there's editorial um, influence there as well. So one has to check in with the editor, and depending on, you know, sensitivity of the subject, it might get cut or it might get adjusted. But there's a little bit more freedom, I think, than in other spaces. Right, the conversation isn't often about content, it's often about search engine optimization. Yeah. Mm. It's often, exactly, how, how, I mean, it's, it's talking, this, they, they will constantly monitor the, the viral potential of a given story mm -hmm. and pull stories very quickly if they don't appear to be moving quickly. Mm. Uh, retitle, they'll A-B test different headlines, they will put them in different locations, they do all sorts of, of, of things. I mean, it is entirely, entirely driven, oh, it's, uh, much of it is algorithmic, too. Yeah. Mm. Uh, there's a huge industry of people who are, you know, who, who know how to optimize a search engine, right. uh, how to optimize content for search engines. And, and, and as for soap operas, maybe you know. And for, and for, right. and for Total now. Yeah, yeah. So t t uh, one of the big players is Junior Total, a company called Byte yeah. Dance and their product, mm -hmm. which is an entirely AI driven, supposedly personalized news site, which has just supplanted a lot of news. I mean, they don't produce news themselves. Yeah. They okay. aggregate, yeah. but they are extremely, be, everyone is, is gearing their news so that it will be picked up by Total and, and pushed to the audiences cool. they look for. Uh, Think of what happens here on steroids, basically. Yeah, <laughs> in the back. Um, my name is Hong Zhang. I'm, uh, I previously worked for Caixin Media, but now I'm a PhD student at George Mason University. So my question for you, Maria, and first of all, thank you for your talk. Um, I'm really wondering to what extent you can um, generalize across the board that the investigative journalists are taking a collaborative approach towards the reporting that they have this, um, they are consciously, uh, they're conscious about, they want to present the reporting in a more constructive way. Like the examples you raised about um, having an official sponsor of the story or, or break the story only when the investigation, the official investigation is underway. Is it really a, a, cl a, a collaboration or is it an, a, a tactic for the media to protect themselves? Thank you. Is yeah. it possible to distinguish between the two? <laughs> yeah. I think it's possible. It's because um, we are talking about how the um, how the journalists identify themselves. How how do how do they see their own their roles are? Um, so. Uh, I, there might be some journalists who think uh, it's better that we take a more constructive approach, that we help with the uh, solution. But also, to my knowledge, I think there are also journalists who think their role is to, to reveal the truth and to really tell people what they need to know, although they need to be careful. They need to be te telling these stories, um, and, uh, and at the same time, they, should be s they need to be safe. Yeah, there, there is definitely, there, there is a difference in terms of how people themselves internally, right, view their roles. 
But just because they want to reveal the truth and that's their role doesn't mean that they end up being uh, opponents of the state in practice, right? So when I look at this issue, I don't look at their, their, all their internal kind of, uh, of a subconscious you know, reasoning, but I look at also what manifests itself in their work, their, uh, their writings themselves. What do they end up doing? How far can they go? So in that group of journalists, you're right, many of them do seem to identify with this almost sometimes even idealistic vision of helping the state, right? But some of them don't. They don't have that vision. All they want to be professional journalists. But when you read the actual articles, the reports themselves, and see how far they can test the limits, they still end up staying within that edge, right, of the system. So that's why I call it collaborative, not because they necessarily believe or fully uh, endorse that collaboration, especially in private, but because that's the pragmatic decision that they make in terms of surviving in the system. I think it's important to understand as well that, you know, there is this issue of the, the very vast toolkit the regime can bring to bear on managing this problem. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, when you have someone, and it's very deflating, when you have someone like the Nanfang Duomo and people basically say, I'm done, this isn't going to happen anymore. <laughs> That's a very powerful statement for uh, an entity that was at it for such a long time um, mm -hmm. in China. Next question, somebody from this side maybe? Yes, sir. Uh, wait for the mic, please. Sure. Uh, Stanley Kober. Um, this conversation reminds me of my student days in the Soviet Union. Okay, the Soviet Union had this sort of propaganda, have control of the Soviet students. My impression is it didn't work all that well. It worked a little well. I mean, because their information was restricted, so you couldn't be sure. Um, but I was struck they didn't have a very high opinion of the Communist Party, despite all the propaganda. And I'm wondering if something similar might be going on in China. We're yeah, asking, you know, we're assuming that if they do all this, it has the effect. But has anybody actually gotten some sense of, the, say, the Chinese students? Because I said this recalls my own student days in China, how they are affected by this. Well, the effectiveness is always a tricky thing to measure, right, in terms of how do we see <coughs> what the support is for the party, and is it all a result of propaganda? So I think the first thing to keep in mind is that China is definitely doing much better today than it has been decades ago in terms of its economy, right? And many people are satisfied with the progress that uh, the state has been making. So propaganda alone is not going to work if you don't have the substance to back it up, right? So I think in the late Soviet Union, many people were also frustrated with just how the economy was doing and what the party was doing in terms of governance. So when it comes to Chinese state, I think they were very careful to at least try to improve certain areas of governance, but also to grow the economy. And of course, it's also a tumultuous process. Not all of it, all of it is, you know, as you need, but the idea of improvement is clear. So I think that's, that's probably why we're seeing some high statistics in terms of uh, support for the party. I mean, the kind of numbers that come out of surveys, at least as far as I've read, continue to suggest that there's critique of local officials, but still a fairly high support of, you know, high level central government, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, how much of it is completely sincere? You know, there are surveys, so not everybody's going to answer exactly what they believe to a survey, but there are very few other ways to kind of measure that on a larger scale. So that's as far as I think we can get in social science to kind of see, you know, how, how, how much does the public support the regime. If you look at students, you know, I've looked at student population myself in my research, looking at ideology, how they consume it, what they believe in. Yes, there are very many of them are very critical, very open-minded. They read a lot of Western news content. They're willing to work abroad. You know, they're not buying into very specific ideological constructs. They're not interested in them. Oh. But I, they, uh, yeah. you know, will they completely take on the party and say, hey, we're done with this, we just want to move? Not necessarily. So it's sort right. of a, it's a more of an ambiguous, I think, a relationship that they have with the with ideology itself. It's like, do we believe in all those slogans? We don't care. But then, do we believe that so some things are getting better? Yes, we do. So it's sort of a, it's a mixed batch. So I think it's hard to dismiss it as one way or the other. But mm -hmm. according to numbers, there's still a very high support for the the central state. Yeah, I think it's kind of ironic that here in the United States, in countries like Australia, the problem with students seems to be their excessive ardent jingoism, <laughs> their love of, of the CCP, rather than the opposite. Uh, yeah. yeah, they get more nationalistic also. Right, they seem to. Uh, it, it, it's striking. I mean, I think this is a, a very important point. You know, the, the long-cherished notion here that um, students come here and they study for, in some cases, long periods of time. They're exposed to the true internet. The scales fall from their eyes and they hate their government. It, it's just not accurate. Right. Um, yeah, you've been very patient. Thank you. Nicholas Romero with uh, Foreign Policy Initiative Future Leaders. Uh, was, my question uh, relates, well, actually, two parts. Uh, one, have we considered like uh, the Straussian concept of esotericism and protecting themselves through so somewhat esoteric writing? 
Um, and then I guess the second point is, um, in, a, in a more confrontational and expansionist Chinese uh, age, I mean, are we, do we consider pot uh, potentially uh, critical Chinese journalism in, in an era of uh, Chinese conflict, for instance? How do we see a critical Chinese journalist perhaps provide uh, collaborative um, interaction with the state um, in a, a Chinese conflict abroad or in the near abroad, for instance? Um, is, is, there, is there room for providing suggestions for how the PLA conducts its activities? Uh, with the first question, I think I don't completely get the esoteric part, but is it about protecting oneself through more ambiguous language or kind of trying to be, yeah, using, if that's what I understood, then yeah, there's definitely a lot of that um, device, if you wish, or attempt being deployed by many journals. And the vagueness, it's not even the vagueness, but the use of metaphors, and just oftentimes not very critical language, but sophisticated messaging that read between the lines. And I think that's something that, again, you know, going back to the Soviet Union, that was happening quite a bit in the Soviet press, and those who read the Soviet press would find, you know, messages hidden in between the lines, as opposed to just outwardly there. So if you look at Chinese media, and some studies have done that in a quantitative manner, and you just say, how many negative words come up, right? How many critical words come up? And you look at that, and you probably will find it, I mean, Rebel people, they will have the most critical words, because there are certain allowed, you know, tolerated words that are, uh, they're able to publish, but if you look at the more maybe liberal voices, they will not have many critical words in them. They'll have much more, you know, uh, indirect language. And I think that language takes a while to analyze, but it's important because it signals to a specific public, not to everybody, uh, maybe different alternative frames on various issues. When it comes to the foreign conflict, as far as I know, it's just a very sensitive area. So I think it's quite hard for journalists, um, critical journalists, to comment on what PLA should or should not be doing. <laughs> Um, and there are many it's restrictions. One of the no-flies. <laughs> no <-fly>, yeah. <laughs> but also in terms of foreign relations themselves, those are set quite highly from the top. So, mm -hmm. you know, critiquing how certain policies should go, I think that level of critique hasn't quite been as uh, active, you know, from my, from my observation. Let me qu sneak one quick question in. Uh, we are privy once in a while to what are purported to be editorial directives uh, on, for example, uh, the uh, China Digital Times, mm -hmm. uh, they, they publish the Ministry of Truth right. uh, directives. Are, are these accurate as far as you can tell? Do well, they seem to come, they, they are they well sourced? They seem accurate, but they're, they're kind of like, a, uh, the gentleman here said at the beginning, it's sort of like one fragment of a picture because they get those uh, sure. leaks from one specific place. Right. So is it accurate about the whole uh, national spectrum? Not necessarily. Right, right. there is no single national there directive. Is no right. And one of the things I also argue in the book is that there, there's a lot of diversity and kind of conflicting signals when it comes to restrictions themselves. Uh -huh. And now, especially you know, with Wang Xiban, you know, controlling the media, but also with propaganda departments sending different messages, I've seen journalists literally receiving different instructions uh -huh. on, a, right. on the same story. So I think that it's accurate to the point that this particular thing is probably true, but then is it accurate as a whole, or are there other messages that we're missing? Uh, that's another question. Yeah, people I know who have worked for internet companies, I'm not saying who, yeah. have, have <laughs> for example, used to be able to kind of navigate the, the gaps between what SARF says and what sure. GAP right. says, right, 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 what, what, right. what yeah, what's in or, yeah. I think that's probably why you've seen some of the efforts at homogenization. Right, right, you know, right. It's, it's all come under CAC now, and it's a little bit tougher. Right. But, uh, and just to come back to the PLA question real quickly as well, I think it's important to understand that, you know, whether the journalists are interested in the topic or not, and the sensitivity of it, um, really what you have is a situation where there, there is no Chinese CSIS or RAND Corporation. You know, the, the, the PLA maintains a monopoly of expertise on its own um, endeavors. Yes, sir. sir. John Olden with the U.S. China Strong Foundation. Uh, fascinating discussion. I'm curious to, if you could say a little bit more about the relations between the center and local governments in terms of the uh, allocation of good versus critical news, mm. uh, constructively critical if we, if we prefer. Uh, because as we know, as you said, the, the anti-corruption campaign uh, amongst the people is considered to really need to be, needs to be focused on, on local officials who are responsible for the vast majority of mm -hmm. bad behavior. But uh, so h how does the center and the loc and, and localities negotiate, if you will, what they can say about themselves and what could be said about them? Yeah, it's a great question. And that tension really also comes out in a lot of this, these interviews and the work is that on the one hand, there's this idea that local officials should be disciplined, right? And that it's a good thing to have the media, you know, media report, reporting on certain corruption cases or local governance failures. But on the other hand, uh, the extent to how much they should be doing that is, is sort of negotiable, right? It becomes, many of these small scandals become big scandals. 
over a spectrum of hour because of social media. So if something was local before and it was just quickly forgotten, now it becomes a large scandal just because people are following it. Mm. Uh, so that makes it sensitive, and as a result, there's no more of this encouragement, you know, to keep reporting on that from 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 the top. So this kind of construct is it's in theory it lasts, you know, the idea is yes, you should you should go and investigate, but in practice because issues are so flexible now and because the public is paying attention to things online and local is no longer local, there's no such thing as local, I think, anymore. Right. And that's been a big transformation with the internet. In practice, it becomes uh, actually a very short uh, you know, span of time when you can really investigate, even local officials. Um, so, and, and then on the local level side, of course, there's a, there's a battle. On the one hand, you want to protect your reputation. On the one hand, on the other hand, there's been a lot of uh, effort to uh, standardize crisis communication and um, local official interactions with journalists. There are a lot of trainings going on nationally, very effective trainings, like kind of PR type, you know, strategic communication we see in the West. So there's all this effort to make them more responsive, but at the same time, when it comes to getting a bad story or bad image, they're going to try to, of course, cater the message or mm -hmm. maybe hide some stories as well. So it's, it's a tension of how do I stay res presentable and, you know, oblige this idea of effective communication, but how do I also present a message that really speaks well of my work? Mm -hmm. Maria, following up on something you just said in response to John here, uh, I thought it was really interesting that you said local is no longer just local. Right. So when local becomes national, when, when there's a, a bit of malfeasance in some county, in some province, uh, to what extent does this read, in public opinion, as a national issue? Does this, does this redirect ire toward the center? Well, I think it's in the age of the internet, it reads yeah. as a national issue pretty quickly because a lot of these issues are repetitive. Right, right, right. So they're kind of systemic. And uh, at one of the talks I gave early on about this work, there was also a journalist from former, I think, Taisin, who mentioned that, you know, don't mistake our focus on local issues as something kind of not controversial or a bit cowardly, right? Because a lot of these local issues, they appear across counties and cities, mm -hmm. you know, accidents, Absolutely. incidents. Right. So any informative re reader will know that this is actually a national issue. It's something that appeals to me. And in fact, it becomes sensitive. So I think the sensitivity of local, especially in this day and age, has really magnified. And, um, Just to follow up further on that, uh, because this local center thing is quite interesting. In your research, did you pick up anything in the last few years about how, you know, as we've seen tiger after tiger at the center mm -hmm. fall in the anti-corruption campaign, how some of that traditional, you know, look, the emperor's good, the local official's bad, is that eroding from your point of view? And uh, in other words, was it a shock to people that indeed all the way up the food chain, the apple cart is bad? Or could you get a sense of that? I guess I didn't get a huge shock because it was such a well orchestrated campaign. So it's sort of the assumption is that I, I guess in many countries there's a lot of corruption at, at different levels, but the idea that now they've been highlighted by the state and, you know, uh, punished for it, it's, it's a, many people think it's a good thing and it uh -huh. makes sense that especially the wider public, they hear it on the radio, they hear it in the news, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's a, it's a cause of justice and yeah. you, you see all those videos with officials pleading, you know, penance right. for the party. Right. So there's this kind of sense of almost patriotism that I think comes out Blood of it. Sport. Uh, but at the same time, when you speak <laughs> to uh, journalists about their day-to-day -day work, they still focus on local level matters much more uh, than central level. And I think it's important to note here, to John's question as well, that there's this practice of extraterritorial supervision, which mm. is called Yidi Gendu in Chinese. Mm -hmm. Many of you have heard about. It's a very interesting, I think, creative practice that we don't see in many countries, but in China it's been quite uh, stable over the years. It's the idea that a journalist from one city or one uh, province or county will go to another want to report on their uh -huh. issues because they're controlled by local officials, right? Uh -huh. And uh, that happens all over in Pangpai, you know, they don't report much on Shanghai officials, but they go to Guangzhou or to Beijing <laughs> and so forth. And so, and they exchange roles, right? And they can also only last so long because local officials have networks with one another. Right. They <laughs> complain, you know, to Shanghai. <laughs> so it's not like they are, they're allowed to do whatever they like for forever, but it's a creative strategy to avoid local level pressure for a little bit. I want to I put a question to you about, uh, that, that takes your model and uh, asks you to make some predictions about something happening today, which is Me Too, mm -hmm. Me Too hashtag. So this is, we're Today's starting story. to see this happening. <laughs> Yeah. Right, we're starting to see yeah. this happening yeah. uh, in China. What is the likely response going to be? Are, is this going to be something that journalists are going to be able to sink, sink their teeth into and go after? Or is this too well, much of a sort of load-bearing wall? From my experience, just talking about gender issues in general in China, and uh, there, are, there are also discussions of that in journalism rooms. It seems to be quite a heated issue, like everybody wants to talk about it. Mm. Uh, and from different sides, you know, for example, male editors would say, well, they're not enough male journalists anymore because they, they take up jobs at Pocha or in other places and they're much better paid. They don't mm -hmm. want to do journalism. So why is that a problem? Well, because we don't have, to have women going to all these crisis zones. You know, it's dangerous for them. I'm like, well, why is that? You know, they do it in the US. And, you know, we get into this debate and, and sometimes they're like, yeah, maybe it's not a big deal. But somehow, you know, culturally, I guess it's not as common. And I think it's not just Chinese, it's similar in Russian culture and other cultures as well. But the idea of kind of gender being sort of almost like it's almost an elephant in the room, I think, in many discussions. 
Mm. Uh, there was a case, I believe a year and a half ago, sort of a sexual misconduct case in one of the non-sound media outlets uh, that was widely reported on as well. So this, it's talked about. So I think it's not so sensitive as a red zone subject that you just can't tackle. I think people are going to talk about it. Um, but of course, how they package it, what words they use, you know, what strategies, what metaphors, I think that's going to be interesting to, to observe. Great. OK, I think we have time for maybe one more from the audience. Right here in the place. Yep. Tristan Green. Um, so you mentioned Where are you the from? Uh, I'm just independent. I'm here on my own. Oh. Um, so you mentioned the popularity of global propaganda back home in China. Um, is there a leg of Chinese propaganda that's maybe targeted at like the uh, Chinese living and working and studying abroad, or is that like is that the intent of the global propaganda, or is there like a separate part that's uh, targeted more at the Chinese expats? Uh, yeah, great question. I think there is a lot of the content that's targeted directly at uh, expats, and again, not necessarily a uniquely Chinese tactic, but there are a lot of apps and you know news outlets that are directly to targeted towards diasporas. Uh, it makes sense because it makes them closely more aligned to home, and uh, in fact, some of these are kind of startup environments as well. They're not always official media. There are various kind of youth-type you know publications that target exchange students and just tell them about the world and what's new that's happening in China, and as well as Chinese students abroad. You know, so there are kind of creative outlets that are specifically targeted towards um, yeah diaspora groups, but especially students. So that is a the different. Daily? It's quite a different yeah. content, I would say, uh, from the content I described here. But oftentimes the content overlaps. So if you have a global media uh, you know, presence, say if it's CCTN presence in Africa or elsewhere, of course, some of their reporting will target just global audiences. Some of it is going to target African audiences. Some of it is probably going to appeal to Chinese audiences back home. So it's, 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 it has many, many purposes. And that's why it's potentially quite a high payoff of the investment. Speaking of Africa and Chinese propaganda, so you're on your way to uh, Kenya and Ethiopia, right? And you're going to be looking at the effectiveness of Chinese uh, state media soft power efforts in, in, in that region. That will be yeah. really interesting. Yeah, so that's my, that's my next, next uh, beginnings of the next project. And in particular, Africa has been very successful, I think, space uh, for Chinese media operations. So I'm interested in traditional, but also new media, commercialized uh, m you know, media practitioners there, but also so-called meaning makers, Chinese who are explaining China to the world. Huh. So they include uh, public, public diplomacy people, they include NGO leaders, and so forth. So those who are trying to kind of present a particular vision of China and how that relates to people on the ground. Well, I think that's probably a good place to end off. Uh, thanks very much. If you would please join me in thanking uh, Maria and Kaiser. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was fun. Thanks again, Maria. Thank you.